greed, ambition, and ruthlessness. Commander orders commence operation CC4. Acknowledged. See you at Joe Fest. Hooded Cobra Commander 788 here, and welcome to the final review of 2018. And what a year it has been. This year we have passed the 4,000, the 5,000, and the 6,000 subscriber marks, and we're closing in on 7,000. I'm so glad all of you have joined me on this journey. We did Cobra Convergence 3 this year, the biggest and most successful Cobra Convergence so far, and I got to see a lot of you at JoeCon in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Even though there won't be a Joe Con in 2019, there will be a Joe Fest, and I will be there. I will give you more information about that as we get closer to the event. We started out the year with a review of the Rolling Thunder, a really big vehicle. This year, we have covered figures and vehicles and playsets. We've looked at the good and the bad. We got a lot of new stuff this year, uh, and you guys sent me a lot of stuff too, which I will include in videos, and I'm very appreciative of that. Although this is the last review of the year. It's not the last video of the year. I still have several more videos to do uh, before the end of the year, and as always, the final video of the year is our Q&A, so watch for an announcement for that. To show my appreciation for you, I wanted to finish the year with something special, and it doesn't get much more special than the Crimson Guard. This figure is a fan favorite, and just by looking at it, you can tell why. This one took a while for me to complete and get ready for review. It took a little extra effort, and you guys are worth the effort. HTC 788 presents from 1985 Cobra's Elite Trooper, The Crimson Guard. This is the Crimson Guard, Cobra's elite trooper from 1985. This figure was first available in 1985, and it was also available in 1986. It was discontinued for the year 1987. Although this channel focuses on vintage G.I. Joe toys, I do have a couple modern versions of the Crimson Guard, and we will take a look at them later. As you can see, we have a number of file cards, and I have an extra backpack here. That means we have some variants to look at in this video. There were only two versions of the Crimson Guard in the vintage era. Version 2 was from the Python Patrol subset. It used the same mold as version 1, but but with radically different colors. There were later figures in the Crimson Guard lineage that were not the basic Crimson Guard troopers. There was the 1991 Crimson Guard Immortal and the 1993 Crimson Guard Commander. The Crimson Guard Commander's role is pretty clear. He's a Crimson Guard Commander. It's less clear how the Crimson Guard Immortal relates to the general Crimson Guard troopers. The file card for the Crimson Guard Immortal describes them very much as a regular Crimson Guard the Crimson Guard Commander was released in 1993, and he obviously has the role of a Crimson Guard Commander. However, we already had a couple Crimson Guard Commanders released the same year as the original Crimson Guard Trooper in 1985, Tomax and Zamot. Tomax and Zamot, also known as the Crimson Twins, were released in 1985, and their specialty was Crimson Guard Commander. That's not all they were. They were also financiers, raising money so Cobra could fund its operations. They were also circus acrobats and twins with a psychic connection between them. I always felt Tomax and Zamot fit their other roles better than as Crimson Guard commanders. They don't look like Crimson Guard commanders. They do have some red
red and silver in their uniforms, but their overall blue color scheme does not match very well with the troops they're supposed to command. Tomax and Zamot's specialty as financiers could be useful to the Crimson Guard. As we will learn, the Crimson Guardsmen were not just elite troopers, they also operated as a fifth column. And as businessmen, Tomax and Zamot could provide undercover Crimson Guardsmen with credentials. In my opinion, though, the only true commander of the Crimson Guard would be Cobra Commander himself. I believe the Crimson Guardsmen would be selected for their absolute loyalty to Cobra Commander and would be answerable directly to him without anyone in the middle. As we will discover when we look at individual Crimson Guardsmen, their loyalty to Cobra Commander may not be absolute. The Crimson Guard are often referred to as CGs. CG is a phoneticization of the initials CG or Crimson Guard. 1985 was the reintroduction of Cobra Army Builders. Other than vehicle drivers, we didn't have any new Cobra Army Builders since the basic Cobra Trooper from 1982 and 1983. In 1985, Cobra Army Builders came back in a big way, with the Crimson Guard, of course, and the Cobra Eels, Snow Serpent, and Televiper. We got some more vehicle driver Army Builders as well. Compare and contrast the Crimson Guard with the basic Cobra Trooper from 1982. First of all, I think they both have striking colors. I think they both look great separately and together. But the Crimson Guard is supposed to be an upgrade from this basic trooper, and I think that is evident with all of the red and the silver. The Crimson Guardsman looks like he is an elite trooper compared with the basic Cobra Trooper. The Crimson Guardsman is not your basic trooper. He is trained, he is experienced. He's not a new recruit, as the basic blue shirts often were. Just looking at these two together, it's easy to tell which of them is more important in the Cobra Command structure. It's my belief that the Crimson Guard are on a separate career path from the usual progression of the Cobra Trooper. I believe everyone would start out as a blue shirt when they first join Cobra. And from being a blue shirt or a viper, you could eventually become a Cobra Cobra eel, and then eventually a snow serpent. But if you're selected as a Crimson Guardsman, you would go on a different path. I see the Crimson Guard as being somewhat insular within Cobra. They have their own traditions and rituals and their own special loyalty to Cobra Commander. So even if the rest of the Cobra Army were to mutiny, the Crimson Guard would remain loyal. They're almost like a cult within Cobra. There's a name associated with the Crimson Guard, and that name is Fred. Although not every Crimson Guardsman is Fred, the Fred series has a special place within the Crimson Guard and within Cobra. The most famous Crimson Guardsman from the Fred series would be Fred Seven, who designed and built Cobra Commander's battle armor, and later donned that battle armor himself and replaced Cobra Commander as an imposter. We'll talk quite a bit more about Fred Seven later. We have quite a few variants to talk about, and we will get into them. Obviously, we have four file cards and a backpack variant. There is one variant I won't show you because I don't have it. Some Crimson Guard figures were a very slightly darker shade of red than the others. I don't have the dark red variant, and that variation is too subtle to really be interesting to me, so it's not one I would really track down. But if you really want every single variant, no matter how subtle, uh, be aware there are some Crimson Guard figures that are very slightly darker red. Before we move on and look at this figure, I think this is a good time to look at the Crimson Guard vehicles. Many of you may not even be aware that there were Crimson Guard vehicles, but a couple were issued way back in 1985. One reason they are lesser known is they were exclusive to Sears. They were not widely available at retail. Nowadays, they're considered kind of rare and can be a little bit hard to find. This is the 1985 Crimson Attack Tank, or CAT, 
and the Sentry and Missile System, or SMS. The CAT has the word crimson in the title, the SMS doesn't, but the packaging for both of these showed them being manned by the Crimson Guard. These vehicles are not original, they are recolored, reissued versions of earlier vehicles. You have a black and red version of the 1982 Mobat tank, and a red and black version of the 1983 Hiss tank, and then a black and red version of the 1982 MMS. The colors are obviously meant to complement the Crimson Guard, and I think the Crimson Guard look great in them. Let's look at the Crimson Guard's accessories, starting with his weapon. He came with a rifle in black. The contents of the card call this an AK-48A with bayonet. The AK-48A is not based on any real-world weapon that I'm aware of. I could be mistaken about that, but it looks to me like this is a modified AK-47 with a straight magazine and a bayonet attached. This weapon was reissued later with some versions of Steel Brigade, but instead of being jet black, the Steel Brigade accessory is dark gray. There was an Another reissue of this accessory with the Python Patrol Crimson Guardsman from 1989, and it is also in jet black. I'm not sure if it's being picked up on the camera or not, but the Python Patrol rifle is slightly glossier than the original. That's a very subtle difference, and it would be very easy to mix these two up. There was also an accessory pack version of this rifle issued in light blue. That one is easy to spot. No chance of mixing that one up with the original. Crimson Guards only the other accessory is his backpack, which the card contents call a dress backpack. Uh, it is in red, uh, the same crimson color as the figure. And this backpack actually comes with a couple other variations. I mentioned some Crimson Guardsmen came in a darker shade of red. Well, the backpack also came in those same two shades of red. So you'll run across some of these Crimson Guard backpacks that are slightly darker than others. The most famous backpack variation, though, is the hollow backpack. Uh, this one looks the same as the other one from the face, but on the back side it is hollowed out. It's believed that these hollow backpacks were the earliest ones issued and the later ones were filled in. The hollow backpacks are much harder to find than the solid ones. The most likely reason for this change is aesthetic. You can see the backpack from the front of the figure, and the hollowed out backpack just looks kind of cheap and fake. The filled in backpack looks better. With his accessories removed, let's look at the articulation for the Crimson Guard. He had the articulation that was standard for G.I. Joe figures by 1985, so he could turn his head from left to right and look up and down. He could swing his arm up at the shoulder and swivel at the shoulder all the way around. He had a hinge at the elbow, so he could bend at the elbow about 90 degrees. He had a swivel at the bicep, so he could swivel his arm all the way around. This was an O-ring figure, so the figure was held together with a rubber O-ring that looped around the inside, so he could move at the torso a bit. He could move his legs apart about so far. He could bend his leg at the hip about 90 degrees and bend at the knee about 90 degrees. Let's look at the sculpt design and color of the Crimson Guard starting with his head and on his head he has a red non-removable helmet with a silver detail on his forehead. Uh, this helmet is slightly angular uh, but the corners are still rounded. Uh, that angular nature of this helmet is a bit exaggerated on modern figures and we will look at those later. He has a black non-removable face mask and a silver eye slit. I think this head looks really good overall. I do prefer removable helmets for G.I. Joe characters, but for Cobra figures I don't mind the non-removable helmets because the helmets would serve the function of hiding their identities. The mask on the figure is different from the card art. On the card art it looks like it has a silver mask with a black eye slit. I prefer the way it is on the figure. I think if they had made the mask silver, that would have been too much silver right in the middle of his face. I think the black gives nice depth to the figure, and the silver works better as highlights. There is a variant for this head. There is a short neck version and a long neck version. This is the long neck version. So for you variant seekers out there, that's another one to track down. Moving on to his chest, his chest looks great. He has that red uniform. He has a silver 
silver braided cord that loops over his right shoulder and under his right arm, detail on the front and the back. On his shoulders he has black epaulets with silver chevrons, probably some kind of rank insignia. On his chest he has a bold silver cobra symbol right in the center of his chest. It looks fantastic. He also has silver campaign ribbons and medals on the left side of his chest. His arms have long sleeves in red. He has silver rings around both forearms and he has black gloves. On his right upper arm he has a silver unit patch. It is very intricate and detailed and I think it looks great. His waist piece continues that red uniform. He has two belts in black. One overlaps the other and slings down to the side. He has pouches on each hip. He has silver belt buckles, looks like triangular belt buckles, but one overlaps the other. With an angled belt like this, you would expect it to lead to a holster on the right leg, but it does not. On his legs, we have a continuation of that red uniform. The whole uniform is red, and I like that. I appreciate the consistency from top to bottom. He has double silver stripes down each thigh, and on his left thigh, he has a black gun in a holster and that gun almost looks like a sawed-off shotgun. It's surprising that it's on his left side. That would imply that the Crimson Guard is left-handed, but it's very unlikely that you would have an entire army of left-handed soldiers. We finish up with some tall black boots that are angled at the top. He has pouches on the outside of each boot, and the boots have some sculpted-on spurs. I'm not sure why the Crimson Guard would need spurs, but there they are. The boots look really good, and they're great with this overall uniform. Here's a theory that is probably not true. Crimson Guard has a gun on his left side, indicating he is left-handed, which is not very likely. But... Cobra Commander version 3 also has a pistol on his left side, even though Cobra Commander is shown previously to be right-handed. But for followers of the comic book series, this version of Cobra Commander is an imposter, and he is actually a Crimson Guardsman. So is this maybe some foreshadowing? Probably not. Taking one more look at this uniform before we move on, this is obviously a dress uniform. It is not a combat uniform. It's hard to imagine sending a Crimson Guard into the field dressed like this, but despite that, I think it looks great. It's presumed that the Crimson Guard would serve as Cobra Commander's bodyguards, so the Crimson Guard probably would wear this uniform on a regular basis. I also think this is probably inspired by the Imperial Guard from Star Wars Return of the Jedi. Even though this is not a uniform for combat, the file card suggests other roles for the Crimson Guard that would require him to be unmasked. I do have a word of caution about the silver paint on this figure. The silver paint back in 1985 was not very robust, and it can wear away very easily. So be a little bit cautious when handling this figure. You could damage the paint without intending to. Let's take a look at Crimson Guard's file card, and as you can see, we have several to look at. Let's start with the earliest one. This card was printed on the back of the card on which the figure was packaged. You can see some of the artwork from the front of the card there. It has his faction as Cobra. It has a really nice portrait of Crimson Guard here that I think looks fantastic. He is the Cobra Elite Trooper, codename Crimson Guard. The file name says Top Secret, but we're not talking about an individual here. We're talking about a whole army. So this should really say file name Various. Primary military special Specialty is undercover espionage, and that is important. Secondary military specialty is demolition, probably so the Crimson Guardsman can be a good saboteur. Birthplace is in various countries. Again, we're not talking about an individual. We're talking about a whole army. Grade is E4 or equivalent, which is surprising. He's not an officer. He is still an enlisted rank. This top paragraph says, The Crimson Guard are the elite shock troops of the Cobra Legions. All CG 
Ds, initials, must be college graduates as well as being in top physical condition. Final stages of training take place in the deepest recesses of Cobra headquarters and is purported to involve an initiation ceremony too hideous for description. This paragraph reinforces the idea that the Crimson Guard is like a cult within Cobra. This initiation ceremony is very cult-like, and it could help ensure the loyalty of the Crimson Guard. Since a spy is less likely to want to participate in a hideous initiation ceremony. This bottom paragraph says Crimson Guardsmen are too precious to be wasted on the conventional battlefield. They are dispersed about the country in deep cover, assuming apparently normal appearances and lifestyles. Watch out, that friendly neighbor of yours might just have a red uniform hanging in his closet. I always thought this was funny. Crimson Guardsmen are too precious to be wasted on the conventional battlefield. Is that anything like having a quarterback that's so good you can never play him because he might get injured? There is a variant of this file card that has a plain red back on it. The red back file cards are usually kind of rare. I do not chase red back file cards unless there's some special reason to do so, like some kind of text variant or something. The second issue of that file card changed the text a bit. There's also no black border around the portrait. The secondary military specialty changed to accounting instead of demolitions. The text in this top paragraph changed a bit too. This one says the Crimson Guard are the elite shock troops of the Cobra Legions. All CGs, in quotes, and phoneticized must hold a degree in either law or accounting as well as being in top physical condition. The rest of the text appears to be the same as the other one. There's a variation of that file card that has the same text, but they put the black border around the portrait. That's the only real difference between these two file cards. The final variation of the file card came in 1986. The 1986 releases of the figures changed the background color of the file card from a tan or peach color to gray. The heart of the text on this final file card is the same as the two paragraphs on the previous file card with the phoneticized CGs and the degree in law or accounting. But the entire top section is removed on this gray back file card, and the font size is larger. I can't say that any of these file card variants are especially hard to find, but they can be somewhat difficult to collect, mainly because sellers don't tend to pay attention to which file card variant they have, so they don't advertise which one it is. So you kind of have to just look closely to see which one it is. And often the file card is not sold separately from the figure, so if you want to get a particular file card variant, sometimes you have to buy another Crimson Guard figure to get it. These file cards were written by Larry Hama, the writer of the G.I. Joe comic book series for Marvel Comics, and I think these file cards reflect Larry Hama's worldview, at least at the time, as expressed in the comic books. In the comic book series, Series, all white collar professions were regarded with suspicion. So lawyers, accountants, even doctors, they were all kind of suspicious characters and often tended to be, you know, ne'er-do-wells or working for the bad guys. Uh, I can appreciate where Larry is coming from on that, but that is not a worldview that I share. Now let's look at some iterations of the Crimson Guard that were released after the Vintage Era. Uh, let's take a quick look at this one. This is Crimson Guard version 7 from 2005. This is from the Direct to Consumer series. I'm not going to take this one out of the package. I think we can see it well enough. Uh, this is not bad. I kind of like it. It's not a bad update to the Crimson Guard. Uh, uh, it does change the uniform significantly. Uh, it does have some of the elements of the original, but it has quite a few changes. I don't mind the changes, though. Uh, it's not a bad uniform. It still has that red uniform, a couple different shades of red. I definitely like the original better, much better, but it's not terrible. Uh, it still looks like a Crimson Guardsman, um, and it's an okay update. Now let's look at a couple truly modern figures. These modern G.I. Joe figures 
have updated sculpting and articulation, but they are done in the style of the vintage figure. They're trying to copy a lot of the design elements from the vintage figure over to modern form. This is Crimson Guard version 9 from 2008. This was a single carded figure, uh, and it is a basic Crimson Guardsman with a non-removable helmet, a red uniform, an update of that classic weapon with a silver painted bayonet. Looks pretty good. The gun on the left leg that was sculpted onto the vintage figure is now removable, and instead of being a sawed-off shotgun, it is a very tiny revolver. Uh, it does fit in that holster, but not terribly well. Uh, not a good fit, but you can put it in there. The modern figure does not have the classic unit insignia on the arm, which is disappointing to me. It does have a backpack, which looks a lot like the vintage backpack, uh, but it's actually a hollow backpack, which I think is funny. As with most modern figures, this came with a figure stand that said codename Crimson Guard. This is not a bad translation from vintage to modern, but one problem I do have with it is the angles on the helmet are exactly exaggerated. That's much more angular than the vintage figure, and I don't think that looks great. Um, the vintage figure, yes, like I said, uh, the helmet was a bit more angular than other Cobra helmets, but uh, it was kind of rounded off and more smooth. I think the exaggerated angles on this helmet uh, just don't look good. This one is version 10, also from 2008. It was a 25th anniversary series, and it was in a comic book two pack. It may look the same as version nine, uh, and it even has the same figure stand that says codename Crimson Guard. But this figure is different in that the helmet is removable, and this is actually a Fred Crimson Guard. Most of the accessories are the same, except for instead of that classic weapon, he has what looks like a World War II era rifle. And of course he has a helmet, um, and he has the same figure stand, the same pistol, the same backpack. Uh, really not a bad figure. Uh, in fact, I think I like this one better than the basic Crimson Guard figure because the helmet is removable. And you do have a Fred series Crimson Guard there. That's not a bad looking Fred. And if you put the helmet on, you know, he looks pretty good. Uh, he looks right uh, standing next to uh, the regular Crimson Guardsmen. So uh, not bad updates here for modern figures. Looking at how the Crimson Guard were used in G.I. Joe media, in the animated series their first appearance was in Revenge of Cobra Part 1, but their role was minimal. The Crimson Guard were mostly treated like any other Cobra troopers. You could replace them with blue shirts and it would hardly make any difference. They did have a few moments to shine though. A Crimson Guardsman had a good appearance in the episode titled The germ. That episode exposed a rift within Cobra. Crimson Guard had the most exposure in the episode titled The Gods Below. G.I. Joe and Cobra searched for the treasure of Osiris, which was buried in an Egyptian tomb. There was some supernatural silliness, but it was an okay episode. In that episode, the Joes disguised themselves as Crimson Guard. That's an interesting twist, because usually it's the Crimson Guard that are disguised as normal citizens. The Crimson Guard made an appearance in the 1987 G.I. Joe movie. In that movie, a Crimson Guardsman gets his helmet knocked off, and that Crimson Guardsman is not in the Fred series. I think that was a missed opportunity. It was a chance to tie the animated series with the comic book. In the comic book series published by Marvel Comics, the Crimson Guard first appeared in issue number 29, and he's wearing what appears to be a prototype uniform. Uniform, it looks nothing like the figure. From the very beginning, they talk about the Crimson Guard's role as a fifth column, but they say his code name is Smith. That was later changed to Fred without explanation. In issue number 37, we again see the Crimson Guard wearing the wrong uniform. They are wearing the uniform of the Hiss Tank Driver. That is another red Cobra uniform, but not the right one. When talking about the Crimson Guard in the comic book series, we really have two tracks. We have the regular Crimson Guard Trooper, and then we have the Fred series of Crimson Guardsmen. The Fred series all have plastic 
plastic surgery so they all look alike. Not only do they all look identical, they all take on the name Fred, and they have a number after their name to indicate where they are in the series. We get a focus on Fred 1 in issues number 31 and 32. The first Fred dies in a battle at Snake Eyes' cabin. At the end of issue number 32, we see Fred 2. When Fred 1 dies, Fred 2 takes over his family. Even though he looks the same, the kids know he's different. That's a creepy aspect of the undercover nature of the Fred series Crimson Guardsman. Even the family unit is part of the deception. If a Fred dies, another Fred takes his place, even taking over his role in the family. In issue number 36, Fred 2 confronts Snake Eyes and Scarlet on a ferry. At the end of that fight, Fred 2 is terrified by the sight of Snake Eyes' unmasked face. In issue number 42, it's revealed that Fred 2 is Wade Collins, a war buddy of Storm Shadow, Snake Eyes, and Stalker, who was thought to have been killed in action in Vietnam. In issue number 43, Wade tells his story. He explains how he survived his wounds in Vietnam and how he eventually joined Cobra. At the end of that issue, he abandons Cobra with his family or I should say Fred 1's family. In later issues, Wade would occasionally work with the Joes. Another famous Crimson Guardsman who was not in the Fred series was Professor Apple, who created Cobra Island. His daughter, Candy, was Ripcord's love interest. Unfortunately, she was killed by scrap iron. Professor Apple was killed while protecting Ripcord who was disguised as Zartan. That's a long story. Perhaps the most famous Crimson Guardsman is Fred Seven, who first appeared in issue number 58. Fred Seven was a mechanic, and he built Cobra Commander's version 3 battle armor. At one point, Fred felt betrayed by Cobra Commander and shot Cobra Commander in the back. He then took Cobra Commander's place as an imposter. As the imposter Cobra Commander, Fred Seven fought the Cobra Civil War against Serpentor, and he won. But he won thanks to the intervention of Zartan, not thanks to his own competence. The Cobra Civil War story arc ran through issues number 73 through 76. In the Civil War, the Crimson Guard sided with Serpentor, so much for their loyalty to Cobra Commander. Maybe they suspected he was an imposter. In issue number 98, the real Cobra Commander returned and revealed that, though he was thought to be dead, he was rescued by Crimson Guard. Guardsmen. They were loyal after all. Cobra Commander traps Fred Seven and his other enemies in a landlocked freighter and buries it under a volcano. Fred Seven dies there. There's one more notable Fred Crimson Guardsman, Fred 65. In issue number 123 in the DEF storyline, his son is addicted to drugs and he is killed by headhunters. Crimson Guard appears in the Order of Battle miniseries in issue number 3 on page 7. The Order of Battle series mostly just reprinted the file card text. In this case, it is the text of the final file card variant that is reprinted, but the headline is changed a bit. It says Crimson Guard, commonly known in Springfield as CGs, in parentheses phoneticized from CG, and it has his file name as Cobra Elite Trooper. Of course, Cobra Elite Trooper is his specialty, not his file name. It does have some nice artwork by Herb Trimpey. Looking at the Crimson Guard overall, this is a great figure. I know it's a favorite of Timur from Half the Battle, and I can understand why. You have a Cobra figure with red, silver, and black. From a visual standpoint, it's striking. I don't think I would really change anything on the figure. I mean, he is wearing what appears to be a dress uniform. He's not exactly ready for battle, but it would fit his role within Cobra as a bodyguard for Cobra Commander. And I do suspect suspect there was some inspiration from the Star Wars Imperial Guard. When talking about the Crimson Guard, you always have two tracks. You have the Crimson Guard as elite troopers, as Cobra Commander's personal bodyguards, as a self-contained unit within Cobra. On the other track, you have Fred, the Crimson Guard as a fifth column within the United States, undercover. They appear like any other normal citizen, but they are secretly working to 
to undermine our society. This concept of the Crimson Guard as fifth column has Larry Hama's fingerprints on it for two reasons. First, Larry liked to show Cobra as an enemy within, not some foreign invader, but as a byproduct of the uglier parts of our culture. Second, it fits with Larry's seeming distrust of white-collar professions. Anyone who made a living moving paper around, or moving money around, or winning battles in the courtroom instead of a battlefield was suspect. That is not a worldview that I agree with. I do understand where Larry is coming from, but I also think it's unfair to the people in those professions. Despite my disagreement, Larry did give us some fantastic stories in the comic book with the Fred series Crimson Guard, not the least of which one of them took over the role of Cobra Commander as an imposter. If I have any criticism at all, it's that the Crimson Guard and Fred were maybe two ideas that were forced together. It seems like Larry wanted an undercover Cobra agent, and Hasbro gave him an elite trooper in a red uniform, and he merged those ideas. And the ideas don't necessarily merge perfectly. They may have been developed better separately. That's a minor criticism, though. I love the Crimson Guard figure. I love the Fred stories. And if the only way for us to get both of them is to mash them together, then go on mashing. Obviously, this is a top-tier figure, which is why it was chosen for this review because this review is for a top-tier audience to finish out a top-tier year. That was my review of the 1985 Crimson Guard and the final review of 2018. I hope you enjoyed it. I will be taking next weekend off for the holiday, but we will still have a few videos for you before the end of the year, so we will see each other again in 2018. This was the best year ever for this channel. Now, I understand this wasn't necessarily everyone's best year. In fact, for you, maybe this year year was rotten. If that's the case, well, come on and join this party. This is something we all do together, and so my success is your success. I'd like to thank my patrons who make this show possible. Their support allows me to pay for the equipment that I use to make the show, and for a lot of the toys you see in the show. Even if you're not a patron, I'm just happy to have you here. If you like these videos, and if you like G.I. Joe, please consider giving this video a thumbs up on YouTube, subscribing to the YouTube channel, and sharing these videos videos, that's what makes this channel grow. You can find me on social media, on Facebook and Twitter, and I have a website, hcc788.com. This has been a wonderful journey. It's my privilege to call many of you friends, and the more people we have joining us on this journey, the more potential friends we have, and that is a great thing. I sincerely hope all of you will have the happiest of holidays. I will see you in 2019, and until then, remember, only G.I. Joe is G.I. Joe. Greed, ambition, and ruthlessness.